I'm John Coverstone. I am a clinical audiologist in Minnesota of the U.S. and co-host of the podcast Audiology Talk and Conversations in Tinnitus. I'm delighted today to moderate this session that is presenting and discussing the research and uh, clinical background for bimodal stimulation to treat tinnitus using Neuromod's linear device. Tinnitus is one of the most common healthcare conditions in the world. Studies in the UK and the US have each shown that about 13 to 15% of people have tinnitus. That's somewhere between one out of every seven and one out of every eight people. And with over 7 billion people on the planet, that's a lot of people with tinnitus, to be honest. So it is the number one condition claimed by United States military veterans. It's a big problem. And many patients with bothersome tinnitus are really desperate to get help for this condition. So I'd first like to introduce Dr. Ross O'Neill, who is the CEO of Neuromod and has been interested in this area of research for quite some time. Uh, we'll talk about the Lanier specifically in a little bit, but Ross, when did you first become interested in this and what led you to form Neuromod? Thanks, John. Uh, well, maybe I might give a brief explanation as to what bimodal neuromodulation is for uh, people who are watching who aren't familiar with the technology. So neuromodulation is the stimulation of a nerve or nerves um, uh, to drive therapeutic benefit or to inhibit pathological activity in the nervous system. Now bimodal neuromodulation is the combination of two forms of stimulation. And that's usually in a synchronized or coordinated manner in order to hardwire uh, the effects, those therapeutic effects into the nervous system and to deliver a long lasting therapeutic benefit. And uh, now this is achieved by a phenomenon, a neural phenomenon known as neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to wire and rewire based on sensory stimulation. Uh, so back to then how we came up with, with the idea, uh, I was working as part of a research group in an Irish university, and we were looking at, uh, you know, possible neuromodulatory interventions for uh, these illusory perceptual disorders. So these include things like phantom limb and tinnitus. Um, now, these conditions are where the nervous system creates an illusory perception, a, a perception that's not real, it's not there. Uh, and that happens in, in, in response to a loss in sensory input. In the case of phantom limb, if you suffer a trauma and you lose a limb, then you may perceive pain in a limb that's no longer there. In the case of tinnitus, when you suffer hearing loss, you perceive a sound that's not really there. So we decided to focus on tinnitus because it was such a huge global unmet clinical need. Um, and we got, you know, very palpable evidence of that every time we advertised for a study or a trial, we would literally be overwhelmed with the, with the response. Um, now, we knew that the de facto standard of care was, was kind of hearing aids and sound therapies or, or some combination of both. But uh, despite the kind of the wide scale availability of these um, therapies, the fact that so many people were turning up in response to our uh, recruitment ads, uh, you know, was, was clear evidence that, that those technologies were not doing the job. Uh, we suspected that the fundamental challenge that those technologies were facing was, was essentially a stimulation problem. If the hair cells in the cochlea were damaged um, and, you know, and hearing loss happened, then you couldn't uh, stimulate those nerves sufficiently to, to uh, you know, kind of counteract this, this tinnitus issue. So we started looking at other ways that we could drive stimulation into the, uh, into the hearing system. And that's when we started looking at this concept of trigeminal nerve stimulation and, and then expanding that concept to bimodal neuromodulation. And uh, maybe I might let uh, my colleague Brendan Conlon uh, talk a little bit more about, uh, about that choice of, of stimulation target. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ross. So um, uh, my name is Dr. Brendan Conlon. I'm an ENT surgeon in uh, Dublin, and I head up the otology services in St. James's uh, Tala Hospital, and, uh, which are Trinity College hospitals. And uh, Ross came into me with this idea 
about 10 years ago when we were all uh, much uh, younger looking and uh, easier going. And um, as a clinician, I was delighted to get involved in, uh, in this kind of new uh, model approach for treating tinnitus. I, I would just say as clinicians, as ENT surgeons, we struggle a lot with, uh, with tinnitus patients because we don't have any outcome for them, um, a great outcomes anyway, and all the research would suggest that uh, tinnitus patients are unhappy with the, uh, with the current treatment options that are available or are largely dissatisfied. So to develop some sort of new, uh, new approach to it was a, was a great opportunity. So we, um, we, yeah, we went looking at the trigeminal nerve. We thought this would be a good, a good approach to take in the neuromodulatory approach, specifically because there was coming out and had been significant evidence that the trigeminal nerve and the nerves that innervate the head and neck area do send uh, neurofiber pathways deep into the neural processing center for hearing where they can modulate abnormal firing. They just modulate the normal firing and abnormal firing within those centers. So we thought if we could somehow uh, influence uh, trigeminal nerve activity, this would be, uh, this might help with tinnitus. And by adapting that with, um, with auditory stimuli, then we're taking on this um, uh, bimodal approach. So the trigeminal nerve, um, we, had, we, we came up pretty early with this idea of use, utilizing the tongue to, uh, to, stimulate, uh, to stimulate the trigeminal nerve. The tongue is really ideal. It has um, a very thin covering. It doesn't have a subcutaneous level of fat. So uh, we need very low levels of electrical stimulation to stimulate the nerve, to stimulate the tongue and the trigeminal nerve via the lingual nerve. Um, the tongue has um, a natural uh, electrolyte uh, conducting material in it, namely saliva that replenishes it. So that greatly helps reduce uh, the level of electrical stimulation that might be required. And finally, the, the tongue is one of the most densely innervated organs in the body. So a lot of nerves per, per square centimeter. So again, we can get a lot of neural stimulation to a relatively, uh, relatively small area. Yeah, so I think then, um, you know, we, we developed a clinical prototype and as, as Brendan said, we approached him with the view of, of doing clinical studies with, uh, with tinnitus patients. And, and that really started the journey. Um, we started the company soon after that. And, um, and you know, that's, that's been the path we've been on since. Sure. And before we go any further into this, we do have a poll. We kind of want to find out where our audience is on this topic. And so uh, you should see popping up on your screen here uh, the option to respond to this question. And we just want to see how familiar you are with bimodal stimulation, bimodal neuromodulation for the treatment of tinnitus. So go ahead and answer that now and uh, we'll see those results pop up here and kind of help us to gauge um, you know, how much we want to talk about this and uh, make sure that, that we're uh, sufficiently addressing uh, some of this background information that, that some people may or may, or may not have. So we'll just uh, give you all a moment to Give your answers here and yeah, we're starting to see those uh, pop up now. The, our operator, uh, thank you, Neil, is uh, sharing the results with you here. And we see a pretty good spread. Uh, the majority of the people uh, are kind of split between being somewhat familiar, not very familiar, and really not familiar at all. Uh, so I'll, we'll want to be sure that we, uh, we continue to support some of the foundation of that so that so that uh, we make sure we adequately cover that for you. So Brandon, you spoke a moment ago about uh, why the tongue was selected, but that's not the only method of electrical stimulation that's been tried for bimodal stimulation, correct? Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, there have been a number of studies looking at stimulating the vagus nerve in addition to acoustic stimuli. Now, those studies did show uh, varied results, perhaps some uh, efficacy, and um, a little bit more complicated with that in that those studies, um, they, were, they were coming out of the University of Dallas were looking at, were using an implantable device. So that required a, a surgical incision and a device put into the, uh, put into the neck and wrapped around the vagus nerve. That's a little bit more uh, problematic and a uh, higher level of complications. So uh, the, the great thing about this approach to the trigeminal nerve is that it's non-implantable. It's a, 
it's an easy to use device. You, 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 you wear it, you use it for a half an hour, morning and evening, something like that. You take it away and you put it in your bag. So um, quite nice to be, to be able to take that approach, that non-invasive approach. Sure, sure. Uh, also with us here uh, today is Hubert Lim, who is the Chief Scientific Officer at Neuromod and a neuroscientist uh, for his background. And uh, Hubert, I wanted to ask you, uh, what is some of the science behind this? Why is bimodal stimulation helping people with tinnitus? Yeah, thank you, uh, John, for moderating this. And uh, um, hopefully uh, uh, we can help um, explain some of the concepts of neuromodulation and bimodal neuromodulation. I saw the survey and it looked like probably about uh, more than 50% is not so familiar. Uh, so I, I just wanted to maybe break it down a, a little bit uh, more, some of the background of this uh, to hopefully help people understand. Uh, you, you know, when we think of neuromodulation, um, the concept uh, in a traditional sense was, you know, coming from putting electrodes uh, into the nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, and uh, providing, for example, electrical stimulation and being able to modulate or kind of alter uh, ongoing activity in the nervous system. And that's where this word neuromodulation comes from. Uh, and you know, through that method, uh, people have been able uh, to show uh, improvements in pain. Uh, uh, and also, uh, you know, if you think about in the brain, uh, individuals who might have tremors uh, from Parkinson's disease or essential tremor, uh, they're able to stimulate the brain and modulate, uh, alter that pattern and uh, suppress the tremors. Uh, and so that, that's kind of, you know, where neuromodulation, there's many forms of that, uh, you know, over, over the years. Uh, but, you know, that, that's where that concept uh, terminology comes from. Uh, now, where you think about bimodal neuromodulation, uh, the idea is that, you know, you, you know, bimodal, you use two different modalities, two different ways to modulate the nervous system. And why this is uh, something that's quite exciting, uh, uh, especially recently, uh, you know, with what we're doing in other groups, uh, is that it's a way to further drive more changes and long lasting changes uh, in the nervous system. And this is not something that just happened, you know, uh, discovered, you know, a few years ago. Uh, this is something that's been known for over a century. And uh, the prime example that I'm sure everyone is familiar with on, on this panel uh, or, or in this uh, seminar webinar, uh, is something called a Pavlonian dog or, or Dr. Pavlov. Uh, people know about the dog that's, uh, they, they, you know, they bring food to the dog. And once a dog sees the food, uh, the dog salivates. Uh, but if you then uh, play ring a bell, uh, or even uh, the person bringing the food would go up the stairs and have that sound going up the stairs, uh, then the dog uh, correlates uh, that sound uh, with the food. And so even when you don't present the food, uh, the dog starts to salivate when they hear the sounds, the footsteps on the stairs or the bell. Uh, and this concept is, is where, uh, you know, some of the seminal work was where paired stimulation started to come about. And, you know, 50 years roughly later, Dr. Heb, uh, Hebbian plasticity uh, discovered that in the brain, there's actually cells uh, that are changing their coding properties, right? The way they behave, the cells in the brain, when you do this kind of paired stimulation. Uh, and so why this is important is because um, there's been about 20, 30 years of work where uh, scientists, especially in the auditory field, have shown that if you, for example, present a sound like eight kilohertz and you electrically stimulate the body, uh, you can make the brain more sensitive to that eight kilohertz sound. And if you present a two kilohertz sound and stimulate the body, you can make the brain more sensitive to those sounds. Uh, and so what was interesting was that um, while Dr. Ross O'Neill and Dr. Brendan Conlin were working in Ireland uh, with the Neuromod company, um, uh, independently, I was working in my lab since 2009 to try to figure out how we could alter the brain uh, to uh, enable people to uh, no longer pay attention uh, to the tinnitus sensation or percept. Uh, and so the idea then uh, came about that we could stimulate the body and play many different sounds and make the brain more sensitive to these different sounds. And in turn then be able to make them less aware or attend to the tinnitus sound. Uh, and so in, in my lab, um, and also you'll see, you know, um, important critical data coming out of Dr. Susan Shore's lab and uh, other auditory neuroscientists, um, we basically found that you could make this happen in animals uh, and you could also 
then enable this in subjects with tinnitus to be able to uh, alter their perception or attention to tinnitus. Uh, now, why tongue stimulation? Uh, from work in my lab, we actually took an open-ended approach. We stimulated lots of different body locations and we combined it with sound. Uh, and two regions um, showed to drive the strongest changes, long-term changes uh, in the brain. And that was tongue stimulation and also electrical stimulation of the ear. Uh, and in my lab, we were able to do electrical ear stimulation with sound, um, but tongue stimulation was more challenging. And so when I came across uh, uh, Dr. Ross O'Neill's work uh, at Neuromod Devices, I was quite excited. At that time, I viewed him honestly as a competitor, uh, uh, but he uh, ended up contacting me and uh, we talked about working together. And I thought this would be a, a great opportunity to push the science and the clinical work forward. Uh, and that's how this kind of came about uh, with our collaboration. Uh, but that, that uh, is generally speaking, uh, the, the science, the basic science behind uh, where biomodal neuromodulation comes from. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and Brandon, you mentioned a moment ago, uh, kind of how, how this stimulation works, why the tongue is important. Let's shift over to the linear device specifically. And can you tell us exactly how the device works, how you came up with the uh, parameters that you're using uh, for the type and uh, degree of stimulation that you're providing? Uh, I know you and, and Ross were both uh, partnering in those early clinical trials that led to that. So kind of, can you tell us a bit about that? So the device is relatively, is relatively straightforward. It has three components. It has this controller unit that has really the electronics in it. It connects to the headphones via Bluetooth. And the tongue tip is, has an electrical array that has 32 electrodes. And that connects to the device uh, via a wire, a plug-in plug -in adapter. The, um, the, the patient to use the device is very, is very simple. It's, the, the controller is a bit like a small iPhone or something like that. You just put the headphones on and you put the, uh, the tongue tip in the mouth and that's been ergonomically designed so that it sits just uh, behind the teeth on the surface of the tongue. And the sensation is, is something like, I think the best description I've heard is like that popping candy that used to be around that would pop and fizz on your, on your tongue. It's, it's, it's a little bit like that. And um, patients largely describe it as being, you know, not at all uncomfortable. It's, a lot of patients say they find it quite, uh, quite uh, relaxing. Um, and initially, so the device has gone through, this is tent, the tent a, uh, tent a one trial that we're describing today is really the third trial. Uh, the first trial was, um, was a small proof of concept trial, um, which, uh, which essentially was quite similar device, but a little bit clunkier and, and not, as, not as smooth and a little bit more, um, the, the tongue tip was a little bit uh, bigger in the mouth. And those early parameters were based really around our understanding from the basic neuroscience of what we thought might work. Um, we were initially looking at um, uh, some pure tone noises associated with some background noise for the acoustic stimuli and, um, and uh, electrical stimuli were, we, in, in those early days, we were very much looking at trying to provide a spectral relationship of the electrical signal to the acoustic stimulus. So if you think, you know, a 500 hertz tone, that, that, that would represent a, sing, a particular point on the electrode array and, and 750 would be quite close and one kilohertz would be quite close. So you could almost like you could feel the sound on your, on, on your tongue. Um, and through the various evolutions of the studies, we've modified those parameters uh, to try to optimize it. And I think Hubert's going to talk a little bit more about that and um, what, we, what we looked at in this, in this latest trial. But the device currently, as, as it is, we, um, we're recommending that patient, that the device is currently available in Europe. It's uh, CE certified um, and um, is available in a number of centers in Ireland, in Germany, and in Belgium now. And we, the, the, the current, the current uh, procedure of patients come to the clinic, they have an initial assessment, and they have an audiogram, they'll have a general uh, questionnaire and evaluation of their tinnitus severity by a, by a trained clinician. And then they'll, uh, the device, they'll go away, the device will be uh, the parameters would be setting dependent on their audiological profile if, if they felt they're suitable for the device. 
So they come in two weeks later and they, they're shown how to use the device uh, that, has been, that has been set to their particular settings. Uh, they, we're advising currently that patients, again, use the device for about an hour a day and they can split that between uh, morning and evening if, if, if they like. And, and, and that setting is based just on the results that we've had uh, through the four trials that we've done so far. Um, they come back for review at about six weeks, see how they're getting on. Those parameters, the acoustic stimulus and the electrical stimulus can be uh, modified. And that again is, is determined on how they're getting on and insights that we've had from the data uh, from the trials to date. And they're seen again at three months, uh, further review, see how they're getting on and then they'll, uh, they can continue to use the device. And our kind of our current recommendations we obviously have data from our trials for patients using the device for three months. And in this 10-day-1 trial, the patients used the device for three months and then they gave the device back. But we did monitor them up for up to a year afterwards. But now patients, if they, if they, if they purchase the device, they can continue to use it afterwards. And we're continuing to acquire data as to how those patients are, are getting on. I would say some patients find that they don't need to use the device again. Some patients find that they like to use the device every day. Some patients find that the tinnitus wears down quite well. Maybe it comes back up again in a couple of months. They use the device again. It goes down a little bit. So intermittent, intermittent use. But that's kind of where we are with that at the moment. Sure. What are the contraindications to using the device? So currently, uh, leaving aside the, the, the contraindication, like the, the, the trial, um, because for a trial, we're, we, we've got very specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. But currently, we're recommending that patients, if they have an implantable electrical device like a defibrillator or a pacemaker, uh, not to use it. Now, realistically, we don't think that there would ever be any interaction between the two. The amount of uh, electrical stimulation in the device is extremely low. But because it's a new device, obviously, we're absolutely erring on, on, on caution. Um, and that would similarly go with pregnancy. Um, as doctors, we're always very cautious with, with patients that are pregnant. So we'd say um, not to use it unless, you know, there's some issue where that would countermand that, what it would, you could say is extremely low risk, probably zero risk, but nothing, I suppose, has zero risk. Um, we're not recommending it for patients who might suddenly lose consciousness, such as epilepsy or syncope or, or such like. Uh, for fear that if they fainted while using the device that they might, it might be a choking hazard. Um, and patients who have extreme sensitivity in the tongue, some patients have this condition called burning tongue syndrome and anything on the tongue can be very sensitive. So we're generally not advising it to use, use it in that as we would have some concerns that maybe it could increase it or they'd find it very uncomfortable. And uh, patients, if they've got some lesions in their tongue, um, if it's something simple like a cold sore, that wouldn't be an issue. Just we would say, wait for the cold sore to heal. And uh, that was something we saw through the trial. Obviously, cold sores are, are common conditions and they come and go and it's not an issue, but probably best not to use it during that time. But if during fitting, the, the clinician saw that the patient had some non-healing ulcer in the, in the tongue and the oral cavity, obviously that would need further investigation and we wouldn't be recommending it in that scenario. Sure. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive into the TENT A1 trial. Um, I don't think you were expecting this, but real quick, can somebody tell me what a TENT is? Because I know it's not a piece of canvas. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I can, can explain that. So <laughs> uh, TENT is an acronym that's given to the clinical trials. So it's standard practice to apply uh, acronyms, easy, easy to remember acronyms to clinical trials. So every, every clinical trial, um, you know, sponsor comes up with one for their study. Uh, and that makes it very searchable and easy, easy to find on clinicaltrials.gov. So TENT stands for um, Treatment Evaluation of Neuromodulation for Tinnitus. So that's essentially what it is. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, and so uh, real quick, we have another uh, poll that we wanted to pop up here and just get an idea. I know we have both uh, providers uh, from around the globe and also many patients that are tuning in here to, to uh, watch and listen to this today. And so regardless of whether uh, you as a patient have tried this or you as a provider have tried this, what are the tinnitus treatments that you have used as a provider or as a patient 
in treating tinnitus. Uh, whether they're even successful or not, uh, go ahead and let us know what you've used here and then we'll, we'll uh, pop up that uh, graphic just as per the previous one and kind of show you what our distribution is. But I am kind of curious to see, see what this is. We have such a large audience. Um, this is, this is gonna be actually interesting data, even if it's not scientifically sound, uh, I'm really interested to see what the distribution is here as soon as we have enough, enough responses to pop that up here. So it looks like it's coming up and uh, no surprise that sound therapy tops the chart. Uh, absolutely no surprise there. This has been in the audiology domain for many, many years. Uh, some people have tried forms of neuromodulation. Tinnitus retraining therapy, of course, a uh, very popular approach. That's just over a third of people. And also CBT, which we know has a very large scientific basis uh, for, for uh, its treatment uh, for tinnitus as well as other psychological treatments. And we do know that uh, certain dental conditions and malocclusions and uh, problems with the jaw can cause um, certain sounds to be heard too, uh, which is arguably tinnitus or not, but nonetheless, uh, some people have had dental treatment uh, because of that. So thank you for answering that question. Uh, that was very interesting to see. Uh, so let's let's dive into the 10A1 trial. Um, why did you t undertake this trial? Why did you do this one and what were you hoping to accomplish? Uh, maybe I might jump in there. Uh, so when you are bringing a, um, or you want to bring a medical device to market, you conduct clinical trials to demonstrate the safety, efficacy, and patient tolerability of the treatment, and then use that data uh, in a submission to the relevant regulatory authorities uh, in order to get approval for the product uh, to put it put it on the market. Um, now we had completed a an early safety and feasibility study called TABS. And we use the data from that to, um, to essentially secure our CE mark. Uh, but we embarked on the, the TENT trials, uh, I guess, to build on, on the, the evidence or build further evidence uh, to support bimodal neuromodulation, and, but also to gain more understanding of, of what exactly was driving the therapeutic benefits and then how we could translate that into clinical practice. Um, so the study, the studies were, you know, the Tente one study was a 326 patient double blind randomized, uh, randomized parameter optimization and patient subtyping study. Now that's quite a mouthful, but essentially what we were trying to do was that um, there's, there are a number of settings, stimulation settings of the device and we wanted to examine the effects of those, uh, both in the wider tinnitus population, but also in different patient subtypes. So this concept of uh, patient subtyping uh, is kind of a central theme in the work of the Tinnitus Research Initiative, which is a global organization that seeks to bring together um, tinnitus researchers from all over the world. And, and one of the, um, the, I guess the, strategies of that organization is to identify these different uh, patient subtypes within the wider tinnitus population and to move towards more personalized and targeted treatment uh, of those tinnitus patients when they're in a clinical care setting. Um, so we embarked on the 10 day one and, and subsequently 10 day two trials to, um, to, you know, to see what's um, well, to see if, if, uh, if the stimulation settings were driving differential responses with, within different patient subtypes. But I guess more, moreover, you know, in a kind of a more general sense, we wanted to, to build on uh, the efficacy that we saw in the TAB study and show that um, bimodal neuromodulation could deliver therapeutic benefit in, in the majority of tinnitus patients. And, and you know in a safe way and provide long-term relief from tinnitus symptoms. Uh, but maybe I'll hand over to my colleagues to talk more about the, about the trial. Well, and Brandon and Hugh, you're both involved in the design of the study, um, uh, how patients were gonna be allocated to different groups and how that worked. Um, can you just address that for us first? Yeah, sure. So this was a pretty big trial. And that ran over uh, two years there, 2016, 2018. 
Um, we initially uh, kind of advertised uh, publicly for patients to see if they'd be interested in, in a trial that we're running down in the uh, Clinical Research Institute. Uh, I'd say that this trial actually was a two-center a two, uh, trial as well, and a number of patients were, we looked at them in uh, in Germany uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Berthold Langel. Oh, sure. But anyway, we had um, we had something like 7,500 patients uh, uh, initially applied to get involved, they expressed an interest through that uh, advertising which ran for about a week or so. So it just gives some insight into um, the, the volume of patients out there and uh, how, how willing they are to, uh, to get involved in this kind of work. Um, they then were subsequently um, whittled down through a, a, an online questionnaire to about 5,000 patients. And then about 700, 700 patients were invited in for initial screening. And to run this trial, we knew from statistical analysis, we were going to need over 300 patients. So. Once we had 300 patients that fitted our uh, inclusion uh, and exclusion criteria, then uh, we, we proceeded with the trial. And that was um, 333 patients uh, who were considered eligible, uh, first 33 patients, and 326 then uh, enter, entered in following initial uh, device, device fitting. Um, our selection criteria, obviously we were looking for patients who had a chronic uh, subjective tinnitus, and we were looking at, pay and we wanted them to have a duration, obviously more than three months. So this wasn't some temporary phenomenon. Uh, so between three months and, and less than five years, initially for this group, we thought uh, we, we outside five years, then maybe uh, neural, neural pathways would be too hardwired to, to, uh, to move easily. Um, but we actually increased that out to 10 years in, in, in our subsequent studies. But um, so we were looking at patients between uh, 18 years and uh, 70 years. Um, we were excluding patients who might have a lot of fluctuation in their, in their tinnitus. So we excluded patients with things like many ears disease. If they had conductive hearing loss, they were excluded. Obviously, if they had any of those other exclusion criteria that we previously discussed, uh, they were excluded like uh, pregnancy. Um, we excluded patients who were on um, uh, and neurological medications that we thought might interfere with uh, synaptic activity or neurotransmitter activity at, at, at a neural level um, because we're trying to drive neural change and we thought that might interfere with, uh, with this. And, and, and these were the selection ex exclusion criteria specifically for a trial. You have to understand when you're doing a trial, you're trying to look for a very homogenous group and you're looking for a group where uh, you're trying to see can we influence this this group if we can influence this group then we can expand that out more to the to the to the general population we were looking we were including patients who had um tinnitus in in the moderate to severe groups so thi scores were between 28 and 76 i think so if they were very mild we thought it's going to be very very difficult to prove that we're improving anything if they were extremely severe, we excluded them because a lot of those patients at that very high end have a lot of other neurological issues and they can have issues with anxiety, stress, depression, et cetera. And they can be quite a difficult, we thought it would be quite, they'd be quite a difficult group to manage within a trial setting where uh, we're trying to keep everything very, very homogenous and keep people on, 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 on trial and that they turn up for every, every, every visit. That was largely our selection and exclusion criteria. And maybe I'll bring Hubert in here to discuss uh, the treatment settings. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dr. Conlon. Uh, that was a good uh, introduction and coverage. Uh, so, so what I, you know, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about our design of the study uh, in terms of the, the different arms. Um, you know, when, when you're thinking, and, and this is for everyone on the webinar, uh, who may not uh, be familiar with uh, clinical trial design uh, and invitation. I mean, it's a large undertaking. You know, there's a lot of things we have to keep in mind um, and aspects that we need to satisfy uh, for a good clinical trial. Uh, and, you know, we could talk more about these during the question and answer. Um, you know, I'll bring up two aspects that are quite important. Um, one is, uh, you know, what kind of outcome measures do you use um, to assess um, the, the effect, you know, the effectiveness or efficacy of the study. And you want to pick outcome measures that are um, representative of, of being clinically meaningful uh, and relevant for what uh, individuals will experience in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so that's one aspect. 
the second thing, uh, important aspect, you know, of many um, is, you know, how do you design it in terms of what you're going to do for the, the different treatment arms, right, uh, to be able to compare and show, um, you know, how uh, different parameters or, or how different conditions um, are uh, driving the therapeutic effect um, uh, and that there is effectiveness happening. Uh, so for the first uh, point, um, you know, we, we did strategize and also talk with experts in the field uh, and also our team of experts and uh, trying to figure out what are the best outcome measures. Um, and one of the challenges with tinnitus, uh, which is important to, to convey is uh, there is no uh, objective measure. Uh, there isn't, you know, if you have some kind of a heart condition, you can measure your heart rhythms and your, your heart patterns. Uh, for tinnitus, there isn't an objective measure. Um, but there are uh, quite commonly used uh, tinnitus questionnaires uh, that do um, uh, are highly correlated and reflect um, how individuals um, are reacting or, or responding to their tinnitus on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and uh, you know, two commonly used questionnaires, um, uh, and what we decided to use in this study is tinnitus handicap inventory and tinnitus functional index. And, and these were two uh, there are several other uh, ones out there, uh, but these are two common ones uh, uh, that are used. Uh, and so we decided to use these two questionnaires uh, as our outcome measure uh, that we do believe represent um, the tinnitus symptom severity uh, and how an individual will do day-to-day, uh, uh, -day. so clinically meaningful. And there's many papers uh, on that topic. Um, so then in terms of the second point about how do we design the study, uh, many of you, you know, unfortunately, were aware of COVID-19. Uh, and you know there are vaccine studies that I'm sure many of you have been hearing about. You know you have the vaccine, but you need to show uh, that it's efficacious, right? Uh, in addition to safe. And so for that, you know you have the vaccine, but you also have a fake vaccine, and you can do this uh, blinded approach. Uh, for medical device treatments, this is a big challenge, especially for non-invasive technologies. And for our approach, we have um, tongue stimulation and sound, and both you can feel those. Uh, and so. Uh, you know, it's important to uh, provide blinding so that, you know, you can, the, the individual doesn't know which one they're receiving, as you saw in these vaccine studies. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, you want to have different uh, uh, settings. Uh, and so what we did instead, um, the way we designed it is that we decided in a creative way that we're going to allocate different stimulation settings to different arms. Uh, and this way, then, each of the arms can serve as a control for the other arms. And then we can see kind of what the effects are. And so this study does that. And we have another study we could talk about later, 10A2, and then future studies where we're continuously you know, working towards so we can look at what features are contributing to the therapy. So those are some important aspects of our design. Um, and so we had three different conditions, uh, three arms. Uh, the first one is based on uh, research that evolved from what Dr. O'Neill and his, his colleagues had worked on, uh, where we have tongue stimulation uh, that was combined with sound stimulation, and they were synchronized together, presented at the same, or you know, simultaneously. Um, the other condition uh, is that we introduce some delays between the tongue stimulation and the sound stimulation, which are these tones that are being presented. Um, and that, that was based uh, you know, on different studies showing uh, that there are delays, uh, different delay lines uh, and, and delay effects between these two modalities, and also to see if change in the delay would alter the therapeutic outcomes. And then the third uh, arm, uh, you know, there's other, some other subtle changes, but th these are the key changes. And then the third arm, you had tongue stimulation with sound, uh, but much longer delays. And we also changed the frequencies of the tones that are being presented uh, to the ears. So those are the three conditions. Now, what we uh, found from the study, uh, which, uh, you know, here's some data that's being presented and we have publication that if you're more interested in the details of the results, um, but there's two main findings that we're looking for. Uh, these were our primary uh, outcome measures, our, our key findings that we said that we are looking for in this study. Uh, the first is that we wanna know, uh, do these treatment arms uh, provide a therapeutic effect, uh, a significant benefit uh, to each individual? Uh, and the second, Thing we're looking for is, are there differences between the stimulation settings? So when we look at our first outcome, uh, we showed that there were significant benefits, improvements in these outcome measures. Uh, and uh, those uh, effects were significantly uh, improved from when they started treatment till the end of treatment of 12 weeks. And here we decided to show, you know, each of these points um, are, are 
different individuals who are in the study. Uh, and when you look at the percentage, uh, um, maybe, maybe we can move to the next slide, Neil. Uh, when we looked across the, the different groups, um, uh, we saw that 86.2% uh, uh, showed some improvement uh, in those outcome measures. This is particularly for the Tindus handicap inventory uh, after 12 weeks. Uh, and what was quite encouraging and surprising to us is that we also saw that 80.1% uh, of individuals uh, uh, after the treatment stopped uh, 12 weeks showed uh, improvements in their, in their tennis handicap inventory score uh, out to 12 months post-treatment. Uh, so this is quite encouraging. Uh, and it is telling us that, you know, supports that there are some long-term changes happening. Now, our second outcome measure, which I mentioned was finding differences between arms. We did not identify a significant difference between the three different treatment arms. Uh, and so at this stage, we can't say what features or components are actually driving uh, the therapeutic outcomes. And this is uh, the focus of a, a second large scale study that's uh, just finishing up closing out um, called Tent A2. Uh, and future studies that we're actually investigating with partners uh, to, to answer and, and look into those further questions. But I'll, I'll stop maybe there. And then Brent, uh, Dr. Common, if you want to present some of the, there's some other results yeah. higher level. That you can, can I talk. just come in there on, 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 that, on that one? Neil, if you leave it on that slide, uh, just for, uh, for our, our, our viewers, uh, just to show some interpretation of these slides, obviously these were the three slides. If you look at that top layer, that's the, uh, this is the tinnitus handicap inventory. If you look the, on the x-axis, that's the baseline for where you started. And on the y-axis, it's the, where you finished. So you can imagine that if you started at 20 and finished at 20, your dot plot would be exactly on that diagonal line. But if you started at 20 and you finished at 10, you're shifting to the right. So all those dots that are to the right of the diagonal line are individual pa patients and whether they improved or not and by how much they improved and also depending on how bad they were when they, when they started. So I think it's quite clear you can see that the vast majority of the patients have all moved in arm one, arm two, arm three, to the right of the line that showed improvement. Few on the left for sure, um, which you would expect. And that similarly is very true for the, uh, for the TFI. But I think that diagram which shows all the individual patients, the difference between where they started and where they finished is, is quite powerful. Um, might go on there on the slides there, Niall, um, if you go on to, and you can go on um, one more. Yeah, so interestingly enough, we followed these patients out. So just kind of to, uh, to restate that the, uh, the patients had the device for three months. Uh, we tested them at six weeks during that three months. And what we found was that most of the improvement occurred within uh, the first six weeks. Uh, we don't have that plotted on this graph, but it seems to be the effect that we're showing is 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 very is very is very is very quick. This graph represents all the patients who we who came back for follow up right out to uh, to a year after a, com a completion of treatment, and we can see that while they had significant improvement in their THI scores, uh, that represents uh, I think about twelve points. They maintained those improvements out. Uh, to a year. So this again was quite suggestive that we're driving permanent effects because none of these patients used the device after three month treatments, the, uh, the machine was handed back to the, to the researchers. Um, our overall, overall in the group of patients, we had more data on patients who uh, completed, who, who uh, we had more data, a bigger cohort that we had data follow up on three months. So the average drop in the THI in the overall group in, during that three month treatment was 14 points on, on the THI. And that result was highly statistically significant. P-value was less than 0 0.0001 on that. Um, and there's, there's a lot of research evidence to suggest that if you get a THI improvement in seven points, that's going to be something you notice. So for sure, if you went from 41, from 42, 41 to 42 or 42 to 41, you won't notice it. But if you get more than seven point change, you're likely to get improvement. So we're showing 14 point changes at, 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 at three months. So that was, that was quite impressive uh, comparative to any other interventions in the literature. Um, we'll go on one more slide there, Neil, please. Um, so yeah, we, we asked the patients whether uh, they recommend using the device 
uh, to friends or somebody that they knew who had tinnitus. And nearly 78% of, of participants said that they would. And overall, that exit question, two thirds of them said they felt that they had got benefit from the device. So this was just interesting overall, overall feedback from the patients and is quite powerful, I think, from, for treatment for a condition for which there is, let's say, poor evidence uh, for anything that has great interventional effect. A bar, I'm going to say CBT, which did, was shown recently in a, in a seminal paper to improve THI scores by about 10 points after eight months of CBT treatment. So I think we're holding up quite well with, um, with, with, with CBT. Well, there's one thing I want to point out here. It's not specifically on the slides, but when you look at the different arms, they all saw improvement, correct? And it looked like it was somewhat similar improvement. Or, or do you feel like you saw a difference between those, a significant difference? Um, so there was, there was no significant difference between the three arms. Um, uh, certainly statistical difference. There were minor differences, but there was nothing statistically significant, which leads us to believe that we don't, that, that it doesn't seem to be a huge difference between the, the on, on this study, between those, those different uh, stimuli pattern. We did see trends in the long-term data that suggested that arm one and arm two were were looked better than arm three but maybe hubert you'd like to add something to that yeah i thought i thought hubert when we talked on conversations in tinnitus a few weeks ago you had mentioned some differences in the arms for for some of those outcomes yeah and and again going to kind of clinical trial design um you know another point that's important is you need to pre-specify you know what your outcomes and your your endpoints are going to be uh, and so we had pre-specified that we'd have a between arm uh during treatment, right, from baseline to 12 weeks. Um, but when we did post hoc analysis, and this is why uh, Dr. Conlin uh, rightly said it, you know, there are trends, uh, we did see significant differences between treatment arms uh, at the 12 month uh, mark, right? So we did see differences, significant differences, but they're significant in a sense of post hoc, right, uh, analysis. So that's really encouraging. Uh, but you know, this is something that can be pre-specified in a, in a preceding study, but we did see, for example, ARM1, which was the synchronized condition, was significantly different from ARM3, um, you know, uh, which was the asynchronous stimulation pattern at 12 months post-treatment. So that was quite encouraging. But, you know, we want to be cautious in making those claims just to say they're trends because of, um, of how they were specified, pre-specified in the study or not. Um, but, you know, with that said, what's really fascinating to me you know, I, I've done pilot studies for tinnitus treatment, and what I haven't seen, and, I, and, I, and to my best of my knowledge, I haven't seen in the literature either, is doing something, an intervention, and then 12 months later, still having that effect uh, last. Um, you know, obviously cognitive behavioral therapy and other, you know, methods, but, you know, we're talking about a device intervention here where you're seeing 12 months out from when the device was returned and these effects going on. So I, I think that's the part that yeah. we were quite excited, encouraged by that there is an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I want to get on to our next topic. We have just a couple of minutes. And we want to have some time for Q&A because we have, uh, I'm, I'm being told we have quite a few uh, questions that have already come in. And, um, but, but what I'm thinking of, you know, tinnitus treatment is so hard, as you mentioned earlier, because you can't, it's hard to compare it to non-treatment. Right, or it's, or it's hard to compare it to a sham. I mean, as you said, you can't give people headphones and a tongue stimulator and not stimulate because they know it. Uh, you can't do that. Uh, but this is building on years of previous research, as we talked about earlier on, where these stim parameter, uh, stimulation parameters and, and uh, you know, the design of everything that led to this point is showing us that we are getting a better uh, outcome than, than if we had you know, used different different parameters or different uh, types of stimulation. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, John, and, and, and I think that's where, um, as we continue to do more studies with our partners, and we have uh, several already, uh, you know, in discussion and planning, um, we're going to be able to provide even further evidence uh, of the different features that are driving this therapeutic outcome. 
uh, and, and it goes on with the theory, right? I mean, if you do paired stimulation, that Pavlonian concept, uh, people have shown in the brain that there are long-term changes happening uh, when you pair sound with a non-auditory stimulation, like body stimulation. So we already know from, you know, a hundred years of uh, behavioral and, you know, 50 plus years of brain science that pairing stimuli does cause long-term changes in the brain. Um, you know, and, and so that's already kind of backing a lot of what we're doing, but we are continuing further research and in, in studies to build this evidence. Cause we do understand that the community uh, expects it of us and we expect it of ourselves. And then that's why we're moving in that uh, rigorous and transparent uh, direction. So that was my next question. And, and just to keep an eye on time in one minute or less, uh, <laughs> what is next? Uh, what's coming up? Cause I know you're already engaged in, in some of the next research that, that's planned. Yeah, so I might jump in there. So what's what people should watch out for next is the uh, publication of the 10 day two study. So uh, with each study, we, you know, we get new insights and uh, we, you know, the the technology is this this technology is it, there's never been a bimodal neuromodulation device for tinnitus so it's brand new technology and with each of these studies and and also with our uh, you know real world evidence we continue to to improve the technology so the tente two results built on the insights that we learned in the tente one studies and then we deployed some uh, stimulation strategies which led to even better outcomes in that study so I think that that will be quite exciting. Um, and then, as Hubert said, we will continue to, you know, to do more and more clinical research and, and continually improve the technology. Uh, in addition to that, then our mission is to make the technology as widely as available as possible. So, you know, it's, it's not yet available in the U.S. market, but we were working to get FDA approval to make it available to the many tinnitus sufferers that are in the U.S. Uh, and then similarly in other uh, markets as well. So I think that's that's what's what's next in store. Okay, great. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the questions that we have for the Q and A. I know Neil's been working uh, as your questions have been coming in to collate those for us. I'm sure many of the questions are the same, so he's trying to get an idea of what's being asked a lot. And and uh, one of the first things uh, that's come up, uh, I, I imagine repeatedly, is um, and you talked about this a little bit, but how was the study control? What were the controls for the study? Yeah, I, I could talk about that. And so um, mentioning uh, to what Dr. Conlin had, had said, you know, we, we are stimulating at super threshold levels. So they, they feel it on their tongue. They feel it, uh, uh, the sound, they hear the sound. Um, so trying to do a, a sham or placebo control is very challenging right? Because you can't blind the individual. So what we had in that first 10 A1 study uh, is to use different stimulation parameters. And so these are serving as, you could think of them as active controls for each other. And so that's how that study was designed. And the idea was to expecting to see significant differences between those treatment settings. And as we mentioned in the data, uh, we did not see that. And so we cannot say which features at this stage, which components are driving those therapeutic effects. And so for our second study, Tent A2, which uh, Dr. Neil mentioned we'll be uh, working to publish as we're closing it out, uh, we did look at other conditions and that paper is fully available um, uh, from the link. I guess um, Neil can provide the link to that, but it, it's uh, we published the protocol paper uh, to be transparent, fully transparent there. And that describes all the different conditions we're doing where we have creatively removed different components to be able to better understand what features are driving the therapeutic outcomes. And of course, we have future studies that are planning uh, with other types of controls or active controls uh, that, that we're moving towards. And so that is, you know, I, we're working as fast as we can uh, to get the data out so that people can see it. Um, and uh, we will plot as we did in the first paper, all the raw, well, not the raw data, but all the points for the individual subjects so that people can also interpret themselves uh, how, how, how well this treatment is working. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for answering that. Uh, and I know that's a big topic for a lot of people who look at this research, follow this research, uh, because there are treatment methods. I won't talk about devices or other methods or what, but there are things we've seen that didn't hold up to a comparative study where, where they used a different type of a stimulation, uh, different type of stimulus, and it um, didn't make any difference. Uh, didn't seem to hold up at all for what they were doing. And you are at least... Are, looking at that and, and are showing some differences in the results. So that's at least encouraging at this point. Uh, someone else has asked, 
Uh, in the early study, and you mentioned, Brendan, that you know, in these clinical trials, you do have to homogenize the group a bit. Um, and then you branch out from there and start looking at uh, specialized groups or groups with certain conditions that you excluded previously. Uh, but somebody wanted to know specifically that you, uh, if, whether you think this device will work for people with tinnitus that fluctuates, that changes, because those people were excluded from this study. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't think there, there would be any difficulty with it working for patients in, in whom it fluctuates, just from our understanding of the neuroscience of tinnitus and the, and, and the way neuroplasticity occurs. And um, we really just excluded patients with very fluctuating tinnitus uh, because it's hard to measure and to get specific points in a clinical trial setting. But, but uh, they, they absolutely, the fluctuating tinnitus is not an exclusion criteria to use the device. It was just an exclusion criteria in the trial itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, speaking of, um, you also, I believe, not as part of the study, but in some of the data that was collected, looked at hyperacusis. We did look, we did look at hyperacusis and there looked like there was a very strong trend towards patients with hyperacusis for, um, for the device to be more efficacious with them. And the data analysis also looked like the hyperacusis patients did much better in ARM1 than in ARM3. Um, Hubert, maybe you want to come in a little bit on, on that one. Yeah, I can. And, and so, you know, the study in that case, um, we did pre-specify uh, these different subgroups and hyperacusis or hypersensitivity to sounds. We had to be a little bit cautious there in how you define hypercusis, but hypersensitivity to sounds um, uh, was one of the groups. And so in that case, we did see a significant difference between ARM1, um, the synchronized stimulation, and ARM3. Uh, and, and I thought it was quite encouraging because I know that uh, Tinnitus Talk had done some of their own analysis, uh, and they also had some data showing uh, this hypersensitivity or hyperacusis group um, showed so showed um, a better benefit too. So I do believe that that there there's something very encouraging there uh, because of course if we can find some subgroups um, and make it more personalized, that's a big win. And so I do believe we're onto something there. I, I want to be cautious because we're going to publish those results and uh, we still need to you know finalize our analyses. But th that's kind of a, a um, you know. A, a show of a pre pre showing the data a little bit before it's published. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we are almost up to our hour. I just want to say I know many people probably have to leave. I can imagine there are there are many clinicians uh, who tuned into this and probably just blocked an hour and so may have to go leave to see patients. Uh, we are going to keep going for a little bit and try to get through some of these questions. And so if you're able to stay on, that's great. Uh, you are certainly welcome to do so. If you're not, uh, we will try to disperse this video of the entire session and uh, let you uh, look at that later online and see what else was asked and what we talked about after the fact. Uh, something that keeps popping up, so I wanna come back to it. I know you probably can't give a concrete answer because I have a little experience with FDA approval processes, but, <laughs> Um, something that keeps popping up, uh, Ross, if you'd like to try to address it again, is when will this thing be available in the U.S. and Canada? Yeah, so we're currently preparing our FDA submission, um, so we hope that that will go in very soon. Um, so we've, we have been interacting with the FDA and, uh, you know, we've sought their guidance in terms of the, the data that we have and, uh, and what the, the final submission um, should look like. Uh, so we're working on that right now, um, and we would hope then. Oh, but as you as you suggest, you can you can never tell how long the process is going to take. Uh, but we would be hopeful that we could provide uh, linear to patients in the U.S. Uh, in in 2021. Okay, great. Thanks for that. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like trying to get something through an approval process in the middle of a pandemic. But uh, but thanks for that. Um, Another question has come in, what about unilateral versus bilateral tinnitus? And so people that have it in just one ear versus that centralized or kind of spread tinnitus that they hear in both ears. Yeah, we, we, we this wasn't a, a, an issue. We included both patients with unilateral and bilateral tinnitus in the trial. The device is devised to obviously stimulate both ears, 
and the electrode array is a mirror image of of itself halfway down the middle if you know what i mean so it's it stimulates both sides of the tongue and um, the auditory stimulation will depend on the hearing profile in each ear so it will try to uh, to match the uh, the auditory input on both sides but not a problem for unilateral versus bilateral okay and so you didn't see any significant differences in in the outcomes between those groups no or did you look at that no i don't think we did hubert uh no, we didn't. Those no, no. Yeah, I mean, we've explored different analyses, but again, um, you know, we want to be cautious in making claims and trends that we see uh, because, again, they weren't pre-specified uh, for our clinical trial. But we are exploring that those kind of questions, John. And um, in in a third paper that we will get out, we just have so much data there. Um, we will present a lot of that data just to give some glimpse of you know trends that we're seeing that are you know we would love for other groups you know to to think about exploring some of these questions too. Uh, it doesn't have to be with our device, obviously, but just, you know, in labs and, and in my lab, for example, you know, we're trying to explore some of these questions um, that may be useful. Um, and so we want to get that data out there to show these trends. Sure. Someone asked a great question. We know that tinnitus is very highly correlated with hearing loss, but what about people that have tinnitus without hearing loss? Uh, I might jump in there. So um, I, as I said, our original uh, concept was that, or the the what you know, the genesis of our idea was that that tinnitus is a stimulation problem, and that it arises arises from a sensory loss. Um, now, so cases of of tinnitus where there is no uh, underlying hearing loss uh, do kind of challenge that model. Um, now there are a couple of of uh, caveats in terms of you know the, the concept of no hearing loss. Uh, one is that um, audiology tests only tests up to a certain uh, frequency, so they could have you know kind of ultra high fre frequency hearing loss. Um, similar uh, similarly, there's there's a, a concept that has been was. Um, uh, discovered by a research group in Harvard, uh, I believe uh, this this idea of synaptopathy um, or hidden hearing loss, Didn't and this was a type of hidden. Oh, this was a type of hearing loss that uh, people could undergo a pure tone audiometry test and pass it. Uh, but if you did further tests like speech and noise, where they have to kind of pick out those kind of, you know, fine kind of fricative details in, you know, in, in consonants and stuff that they couldn't do it. Um, so it could be, and what that does is challenge the, um, I guess the, uh, the viability of the pure tone audiometry as a, as a test for hearing loss and maybe hearing loss needs to be tested more comprehensively now, but they may go some way to explaining cases of patients having having tinnitus but having no measurable hearing loss i oh, totally agree and i i would say uh on 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 the defense of those of us who are uh clinical audiologists we are moving towards testing hearing in different ways as more of this evidence comes out about types of hearing loss that are not uh, uh don't have an origin in the sensory organ the cochlea uh within the inner ear we are finding uh synaptopathy is something you mentioned where we can have some damage between the, the synapse or the cleft or the connection of the auditory nerve to the, to the cochlea. Or uh, there have been studies even showing some damage to the auditory nerve itself, where simple stimuli such as a tone uh, can get through and be heard at very normal levels, but as the stimuli become more complex, as you introduce background noise or, or a speech, for instance, then a person starts to have a little bit of difficulty. So I assume that's not something you looked at uh, in this study, because that would be a very different level of research. Yeah, so the the one of the challenges when you conduct a large scale clinical uh, study with with hundreds of patients is that you know it's it's li literally a logistical challenge. So when you're doing those kind of kind of in depth analysis and and you know capturing lots of different metrics and we we really did capture as much as we possibly could. We have an incredible amount of data, but you know the 
one of the tinnitus is observable as hyperactivity in structures like the dorsal cochlear nucleus, inferior colliculus, etc. Right, but you would need to to capture that. You would need to hook people up to an EEG, and that's a very time-consuming process. That takes hours. Uh, so there's no way you could do that for 326 patients coming into the hospital on multiple multiple uh, visits. Um, so it's but you know it is something that we could look at in, in on a much smaller scale. And, um, you know, I'm sure we'll get around to at, at some point. Sure. Uh, somebody wanted to know if you could talk more about the difference between the TENT A1 and TENT A2 trials and what it is that you're uh, looking at differently in the TENT A2 trial besides what we discussed today. Yeah, I can talk to that. Um, so uh, something that Dr. Conlon mentioned, um, you know, in our 10A1 study, uh, there were some interesting things. One was that um, we actually saw a large improvement in the tinnitus scores, right, um, at six weeks, uh, even though the treatment is happening over a 12-week period. Um, and so uh, that means that during the first six weeks, uh, the scores got improved, the tinnitus symptoms improved, and then there was a plateau effect, basically, for the second half. Uh, so that was quite interesting. And, and we know from plasticity studies, people that work in you know, the brain science field, that there are some adaptation effects that happen. Uh, and I saw this also with some brain stimulation work I did uh, during my postdoc years. Um, so that was one interesting observation. Uh, the other observation from 10A1 uh, was that you know, we didn't see a significant difference between the three different treatment arms. Uh, and we had some different parameters in there. But the thing was that we did actually have quite a bit of other features in there. We have tones in the sound, uh, but we also have some background noise uh, and some different patterns in there. Um, and so the way uh, we focus in the 10A2 protocol paper, as I mentioned, is published and available. Uh, we actually break it down what we did in the different arms, but we ran a four arm uh, uh, treat, tr treatment study um, and uh, the details there and what we did uh, for example, is to see if, you know, we change the stimulation parameter um, from the first six weeks to the second six weeks, could we drive greater therapeutic outcomes? And so that was, you know, one thing that we did in that study. And then another thing that we did is that we started to remove different components of our sound uh, presentation, like we removed the background noise. We instead presented noise, but remove tones. Um, and, you know, we did different things like this. Uh, we also presented um, acoustic stimulation alone. So these are different things that we have done in that study um, uh, as best as we could uh, and also maintaining blinding. Uh, and so those are things that we have done in the 10A2. Uh, we have presented some of the results at, at a previous meeting at the Association for Research in Otolaryngology last year. Um, and we had we received a lot of feedback um, but that's what we're working on. And we're going to be presenting some portions of those, the primary endpoints in an upcoming publication. Uh, and then we'll present again, all the other kind of endpoints uh, and outcome measures in follow-up papers. So that, that's uh, the difference between the two. Really trying to take it from large scale study, looking at you know, larger bundles of parameters, and then moving towards kind of honing in on which features are, are the most effective driving the therapeutic outcomes and in which subtypes. That's where we're sure. moving to but it will take time uh, to get to get there. Yeah, sounds like a lot more data coming and many more publications. <laughs> a lot of data, a lot yeah. of data, but good data. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. a lot of opportunities to learn uh, in large scales, which I have to commend uh, you know, um, uh, the investors and also Dr. Ross O'Neill and, and the teams for really saying, okay, you know what? Let's not cut corners. Let's do large scale studies uh, and uh, do it in a rigorous way. Uh, and, th and that's why I came on board because it was an opportunity that this could be done, not in my lab, but you know, in, in a large scale way. Sure. Yeah, I, I would second that. We have fantastic investors who, uh, who like to pursue big unmet clinical needs uh, so they're very ambitious and, uh, you know, and, and their ambition ma matches ours. So if uh, I think the healthcare would move a lot further, faster, if there were more kind of investment funds like those guys around. Sure. Um, Ross, let me stay with you and I'm going to combine a couple questions here. Where is this available right now? It's all in Europe, but where in Europe is this available is it going to be made more widely available? And uh, someone else asked, what does it cost? 
So it's currently available in Ireland, Germany, and Belgium. Uh, we are rolling it out uh, across Europe as fast as we can. Um, so we're currently expanding our, our whole commercial team. Um, and, you know, we're, we're trying to get as many uh, healthcare providers signed up um, who can make Lanier available to their, their patients across Europe. Um, and, you know, so I would, I would say keep an eye on the website Lanier.com, which has a map of all the clinics that, uh, where Lanier is available. Um, and, but it is exclusively in Europe for the moment until we get FDA approval. And, and then, you know, we, we would also hopefully make it available to Canadian patients as well as, as US patients uh, once we start to develop a presence in, in North America. Um, so the, the, the price uh, is the, the devices in the order of, you know, two and a half thousand, uh, 2,750. Uh, euros um so that's that's kind of price range we are working on on reimbursement uh in various um uh various markets uh, so the reimbursement kind of um landscape is very fragment fragmented uh, and changes market to market so obviously we do want to make it uh, as available to patients as we can so we're working hard to to get that in place as well um but for patients in Ireland, Germany, and Belgium who want to access it now, uh, it is available, and all they have to do is go to our website to 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 check on that availability. Great, great. Uh, back to the research, they had a question as to whether the specific type of tinnitus. So they said tinnitus tone, um, what we would call the presentation of tinnitus. Uh, so have you been able to separate out groups with different types of tinnitus and look and see whether they are affected differently? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in there. We did specifically look at different, uh, like atonal tinnitus, tonal tinnitus. Uh, they were uh, specific groups that we looked at. And uh, interestingly enough, we didn't find a great difference in the group in the, in the treatment. So equally efficacious in, in both groups. Interesting. Okay. Uh, is there any remote component to that? Of course, this is a big question. Uh, during COVID times here, everyone wants to know, can, can something be used remotely? Um, uh, yeah, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, again, we have, um, you know, launching a product in the middle of a global pandemic was, uh, was not something we had planned for. So uh, we've had to, uh, to, you know, adapt pretty quickly. So um, we have been uh, in Ireland, we were locked down since since last March. Um, and we have been um, making uh, Lanier available um, via telemedicine consultations. So our, our clinical teams have been seeing patients uh, via Zoom and, and pl other platforms. And uh, so it, it is available uh, in that way if patients want to um, want to go to the website and, and book a consultation, uh, you know, so the physically attending the, the clinic or clinics is not currently a necessity given the unprecedented times that we're, we're living through. So, yeah. So I would imagine that's mostly an exercise in, in logistics of getting the device to them and then just having some online consultations essentially to set it up, make sure they're using it properly and follow up periodically. Correct? Exactly. Uh, we have, um, I would say we've done 50% or not, if not more of our device fittings have been done remotely uh, over the, the, the past year or so, or over the past nine months, we'll say. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the biggest challenge is getting a hearing tests. So they, we need uh, the patient to have had a recent audiogram. So if they can go to their local audiologist and get that, um, then, or if they have a recent audiogram that's been, you know, that's been conducted in the last, you know, whatever, three to six months, it'll be up to the, uh, the, the audiologist to make a, make a call on that. Uh, but then we can literally, we can just ship the device to them. And then it's, they, they book in a consultation with our audiologists where they, um, they do a fitting session um, and it's all done over, over telemedicine. Okay, super. Um, we're just about ready to wrap up here. But um, maybe a couple last questions. One will be real quick, because uh, I, I think I know the answer to this one. And that's somebody asked about, are you matching the, the pitch and the loudness of the tinnitus 
from what I understand, the, the stimulus parameters are set. Of course, you alter them a little bit for those three arms in the 10 to 81 study and a bit more for 10 to 82, but all patients within that arm are receiving the same stimuli, correct? Yeah, I, I could talk a little bit about that. And, and this goes um, to the mechanism of what, what we believe we're try, you know, trying to achieve here. Um, there's two ways you can view um, treating tinnitus, right? Uh, one is that you have this tinnitus percept and um, you're gonna try to find those cells in your brain that are coding for that tinnitus and you wanna shut them down. Um, uh, that's one way. Um, the other way is that you just say, we're not gonna worry about those tinnitus cells. Uh, instead, we're going to make the brain care and attend to other stimuli and other frequencies. Um, and so the key thing here is really about presenting a diversity, you know, at least some set number, uh, at least a minimum number of stimuli. And so you could present uh, multiple frequencies, for example, like when we talked about our treatment uh, in the first arm, uh, arm one of that 10A1 study, you know, we have many different frequencies that are being presented. And those different frequencies are changing each time from presentation to presentation. So you're getting a uh, stimulation on the tongue and we're presenting one kilohertz. Then you're getting stimulation on another location of your tongue and you're getting five kilohertz. And then it's changing like this uh, over and over again throughout the 30 minute session that you're listening to. And of course you do two sessions per day. Uh, so to answer your question, the stim is actually changing um, over time throughout this session, uh, but the type of stimuli presented and the range of frequencies and the ordering of them uh, will be the same for, you know, it's like frozen stimuli uh, for that group. Uh, and then a, the second group will get a different combination of stimuli um, that are different, but the same for all the people that are in that second group mm. and so forth. So I just want to clarify that, that, you know, that's our goal is to provide this diversity of input um, to right, draw the right. attention. Thank you. The yeah. So we have one last question. I'm going to direct this to Brandon as our, as our physician in the group here. Um, someone wants to know, will this always require that you see a healthcare provider in order to get this device? Um, well, it's a fair question. You're definitely going to need to see an audiologist to get a hearing test. Um, the audiologist, I suppose anybody with tinnitus, there's some parameters that would lead us to think that you should see a physician uh, with tinnitus. So patients, if they've got unilateral tinnitus or unilateral hearing loss, generally do require some investigation to make sure that there's nothing untoward or sinister going on. It, that kind of in, in, in investigation usually can be provided, or certainly could be provided by an audiologist who could do the hearing test. And therefore, everybody with tinnitus, I don't think, needs to see a physician or an ENT surgeon but they do need to hit a clinical, somebody with clinical expertise in that area somewhere along the line. Otherwise you've got the danger of patients who have tinnitus for other, like, and kind of what I'm saying is that you couldn't, I don't think we, I, we'll ever see a, a position where somebody just rings up Lanier and Lanier sends them out a, a device and they haven't seen anybody. Um, because you might miss something, uh, something that does require medical intervention. Like rarely tinnitus can be caused by conditions such as uh, tumors in the brain, acoustic neuromas, things like this. And occasionally patients hearing loss, maybe conductive hearing loss, may be amenable to intervention and so forth. So, but a lot of that certainly could fall under the, I think, an audiologist. And I mean, here in Ireland now, whereas in the past, all tinnitus patients used to be referred into the ENT department and that provided huge amount of workload. Um, we're developing uh, parameters and algorithms where patients can go to, go to audiology, get advice from audiology, maybe be, have a discussion with a clinical nurse practitioner or so forth, and don't really need to see an ENT surgeon or a doctor or necessarily need to see them unless they fulfill certain criteria or red flags that would direct them that way. And then I guess that person can give the patient the device, uh, give the patient advice as to whether they think the best treatment plan would be, whether that would be linear or CBT or hearing aids or a combination of all three. Sure, thank you. And John. Uh, and so with that, we're gonna wrap up here. I wanna thank you for joining us. I wanna thank Dr. O'Neill, Conlon and Lim for uh, joining us and talking about this today. I have enjoyed this immensely. 
Uh, I'm John Coverstone, and uh, once again, thank you for tuning in. We will make this available on the internet. Uh, we're not even sure where yet, but I'm sure if you look, you'll find it in the coming weeks so that you can view this again or uh, direct other people to it and um, uh, put this out there for you. So um, with that, we'll sign off. Uh, you see the slide there. If you do have any other questions, please feel free to direct them to Neuromod. They would be happy to answer those questions. I can personally vouch they're gonna, gonna answer them with the utmost um, ethical and professional uh, uh, manner. Uh, these are good folks and, um, and, and they wanna take care of the patients first and foremost. So thank you again. <laughs>